Okay, building Persephone. Let's let's see what uh, building Persephone says. Question: In my opinion, Wizards of the Coast machinations designed to monetize and digitize players, corner corner the market, and turn creators into sweatshop f- freelancers. Would Ryan and Mark agree, or is there more to the story? I I don't feel like I'm qualified to have an answer to that question. I'm not in the room, and I haven't seen the business. Um, yeah. I mean, I can tell you that I believe strongly Wizards of the Coast sees a digital future for Dungeons & Dragons. They want to control and own the platform where digital Dungeons & Dragons is played. I think they're smart enough to know that they need to make that platform something that third parties can contribute to, and they want to make that happen. And in order to make that happen, there has to be a way to monetize in the same way that Apple monetizes the App Store and Steam monetizes the Steam platform and Google monetizes the Google Store. Like, I'm sure... It's easy to see the, the way that you do this. And lots of companies have done it now. You create an open marketplace for content that can be sold on your site. I don't want to talk about the ethics of that. If you don't like that idea, that's okay. If you don't want to play a digital version of D&D, that's okay. If you don't think Wizards of the Coast should try to create a walled garden, that's okay. But I don't, I'm not going to have an opinion about the ethics of it. Okay. Uh, we have a super chat here. So the super chats we will definitely uh, take during the Q and A. So if you have a super chat, we'll definitely take those. So Roberto Romano, thank you very much. A four nine nine super chat. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, Robert, oh, Robert Robert asks, Wizards of the Coast indicated in their statement that they would police OGL content for so called hate speech. Can Wizards of the Coast revoke a contributor's OGL for offensive speech? But okay, for, let let's unpack that. A, Robert, great great statement. It, it is such. A can of worms. Let, let's just take your first sentence first. Wizards wants to police open game license content for hate speech. How? How? They have uh, supposedly a policy that allows you to use the license if if you are a small contributor, and I hate the fact that they've defined small and big, but I'm going to use their terminology, small contributor. An infinite number of people could use it as a small contributor. How are they going to police it? How? Are they going to hire an army of people to read every piece of material that's published using this license everywhere in the world in every medium in every language? How do they expect to do that? No, they're going to selectively enforce it. They're going to police it when they want to. They're going to decide, oh, well, this thing is offensive and we want to make it stop. They're not going to police everything. They're just going to police the things that they think matter. Second thing is, can Wizards of the Coast revoke a contributor's OGL for offensive speech. If you're asking about OGL version 1.0a, the answer is no. There is no limitation whatsoever in what you can publish with the 1.0a version of the open gaming license. And over 22 years, the community has proven that it is more than able to police itself to push hateful speech to the side and to push aside bad actors. An enforcement mechanism isn't necessary. The community itself protects against that kind of offensive material we don't want it in our world and we don't we don't use it it doesn't have to be legally enforced because the community itself rejects it so ryan i first off i agree completely the thing that i wonder about is are they worried that that's somehow going to reflect upon them if someone's writing using their rule set but i mean honestly i think they was just this is an excuse to make it sound like they were doing this for good reasons but putting that aside (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I want to get that too. For sure. But Mark, you're totally right. Currently, if somebody publishes something that's offensive, Wizards of the Coast can say, "We got nothing. We're not. We don't review. We have no approval process. We're not responsible for it at all. It is not. It has nothing to do with us. Period. Mm-hmm. Mic drop. Walk away. If they have the right to police it, then they are responsible for all of it. Yeah, they can't drop the mic and walk away. They own it." If somebody publishes the most awful, terrible thing imaginable using their new license, they have to deal with it because otherwise they will be as guilty of making that terrible, awful content as the original publisher. They are they are like, again, there's many parts of this where I feel like they don't know what they're doing. This is one of those places. They yeah. don't understand what they the burden they are giving themselves. If I was a Hasbro shareholder, I would be irate about that idea. Mm-hmm. I, I they're basically taking ownership of it, like you said. They are. But they get it's a double bladed sword. You can take ownership yep. of all this stuff, but you get ownership of all this stuff. That's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. Uh, Open D and D asks a question for Ryan. 
Do you think the trademark itself for Dungeons and Dragons is too generic to move forward after 50 years? Thank you, sir. No, it's the opposite of generic. It has tremendous value. Tremendous. Absolutely enormous value. Like, you, you could take the system reference document, and people did, and just publish it. You could just make up a piece of art, wrap it in a, in a cover, and put it on sale. You're not going to sell very many copies of it. Nobody's going to really want to buy it. But if you do that and call it the Player's Handbook of Dungeons & Dragons, apparently you sell tens of millions of copies. <laughs> That's the brand value of Dungeons & Dragons. Like, look, the analogy I would use is Coca-Cola. Anybody can make some brown-colored, syrupy drink that's fizzy. You won't sell any of it. But if you have the right to call it Coca-Cola, you will sell billions of dollars of it. The, it this, this, is, this is the very heart of why we were allowed to proceed with this project in the first place. And it was a super, super painful thing for people inside Wizards of the Coast to hear and then to live with. The, the work that they did on the game rules has a monetary value of zero. And that the value is in the brand of Dungeons & Dragons. Now, they made that brand more valuable by making really good rules. So what they did was they increased the brand value of Dungeons & Dragons. But the thing that they did has no monetary value. They're just rules to a game. They mean nothing without the brand. Because there are a lot of games with really good rules that yes. no one knows about, yes. right? That yes. is out there today. Yes, that's exactly right. B value does not accrue based on the arbitrary goodness of your game system. It mm. accrues on the basis of how good your brand is. And, and, and I, I am a game designer. I have an origins award. Like, I understand how difficult and painful it is to wrestle with that idea that what game designers really do is they make brands more valuable. It's, it's, a, it's a tough super hard thing to hear super hard and you know what i hope game designers hear is that what they do does add value tremendous value in the case of dungeons and dragons probably a billion dollars of value by doing what they do really well they make that brand more valuable that's what they do i will point out though that that's one of the things we do here on this channel as far as other rpgs so the morning grind is my morning show and for the past two months basically almost every day without fail. I think I've missed four days because of like Christmas and stuff. We've looked yeah. at a different RPG and tried to learn how to play and stuff like that. So uh, yep. the morning grind is the place to look at that. If you're looking for the way other, what other RPGs are out there and how to play them. Super cool. Uh, so Ryan, uh, Abe Green says, Ryan, would you be willing to participate as a witness in any litigation to defend the OGL 1.0A? <laughs> well, I will tell you that one of my friends who is a lawyer, has told me that I should buy a new suit and I should be prepared to spend a lot of time in conference rooms and courtrooms in the upcoming year. Um, I think that there might be a time and a place where I was an expert witness for various parties, but nobody has contacted me and I don't, I have no such arrangement with anybody at this time. And perhaps having done a couple of live streams, a medium article and a bunch of Twitter posts, nobody needs me to speak anymore. I don't know. <laughs> Could be. We, we read the medium post. We'll, I read the medium yeah. post before we went live. So we, we will get to that because I put that on there. So let's do one more question and then, and then go forward because I think this is also an interesting one, and which is the ghost, the, the issue of distraction. So Severin says or asks, do you think that the concession of no royalties will be enough to distract enough people so they can still think they can move forward with 1.0 AO deauthorization? No, I do not. I, I, uh, I was talking this morning with another friend of mine who I, I'm, I'm not at liberty to discuss. And his comment was, they fundamentally do not understand that part of what it means to be a role-playing game player, and especially a Dungeons & Dragons player, but even a Pathfinder player or a Call of Cthulhu player or uh, um, uh, you know, any, 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 any game system you want to mention, part of what it means now is that you are a part of a community of people who have the right of free expression to use licenses like the Open Gaming License to freely copy, modify, and distribute role-playing game product content. They don't understand, somehow, they don't understand it. That is now a part of what it means to be a part of this community. It's a freedom issue. It's a human rights issue. The money issue matters to them. Like, I'm sure that the decision to remove the royalties from their proposed open gaming license was essentially total surrender on their part. Somebody has gone absolutely to the wall arguing for this case on the basis of how much money they were going to make. And that person had to sit in a conference room and agree to take that language out of the license. And for that person, that is the absolute end. Like 
the whole effort is now in vain in that person's mind, I'm sure. But it has never been the point of the objections, ever. It's a problem. The objections are huge and enormous. The money was a part of it, but it was never the reason why the firestorm erupted. And I'm deeply confused by the person who thinks that most of us ever expect to pay royalties, right? Like the, the think that that's the part that was the most egregious to this large mass of us who are never going to ever make enough money doing this to pay royalties to take that out. It's just like, we're all sitting here like, Oh, we don't care. This that, was the shock and awe. that was the shock and awe hammer. They tried to use against the publishers. That was it. They yeah. talked to the people who would pay royalties. Mm -hmm. That's who they're talking to. The people who do make more than $750,000 a year. That's who was yeah. having those conversations. The ones yeah. that really made angry, though, are the ones who are never dream of making that much. And that's where they're yeah, taking they made the, they made the community. Angry. I mean, there, maybe there's 100 companies that publish, you know, commercially uh, tabletop role playing game products. They made a million people angry. I got 12,000 yeah. people to sign a petition telling Wizards of the Coast not to do this. <laughs> Great. Uh, I saw a comment after this that I said, did you see the uh, post from Wizards today? Yes. And we're going to do that. We got a super chat. So let's address the super chat. And then we will go, if, if everybody can stay, we'll talk about what Wizards is, what Wizard announced today. But Merrick Wolf for a $10 super chat. Thank you so much for the super chat. It's so good to have you here. Thank you so much. I believe that's $10 Canadian. It says, do you believe all of this has had a negative effect on the D&D brand? What do you see as a win in this horrible situation? We it's probably all agree on the negative effect, but the win is also very interesting. Mark, uh, or uh, Ryan, you want to take that first, and then Mark, and then I've got comments on that too. In, in, arguably, it has damaged their brand. I, I don't think any rational person could say at this point the brand is more valuable today than it was two weeks ago. Like, I don't know how you can make that argument. Um, what do I see as a win? I see Wizards of the Coast making a public statement that they will never attempt to deauthorize or revoke the 1.0a version of the open gaming license. That's a win for me. That's my, my definition of win. That's where I am today. That's what I want to win right now. I want that. Yeah, and as far as the brand goes, I mean, I think that we can't underestimate the number of people who have no clue what's happening and will never know what happened, right? We can't underestimate that. The ones who are going to go to the movie, people are going to go to the movie, they'll never know and never care. There are even people yeah. in our industry who are just like, chill out, folks. You just want to use their rules for free, right? I mean, it's, honestly, that's there. But the, but the reality is that knowing now that this has gone beyond, like, the, the thing I was saying is that it's great for Hasbro that this has become so mainstream, which means that when it became an issue, the New Republic and CNBC and The Guardian and all the other picked it up. It's like you realize that mainstream has two edges to it, right? right. And as a result, I think that, yes, it has been damaged in part because it's gone mainstream and it made a good story to say, you know, the villain today, the dragon is Hasbro. Yeah. The negative, I think it's absolutely been a negative hit on the brand. I do say obviously within everybody who is actually part of the community is absolutely taken a devastating hit and it took them way too long to put out any kind of statement and recover from that. I think at the speed at which the internet moves today, I mean, that will also be used, I think, probably as an example of how not to handle some type of crisis or leak. As we talked about ISO as examples in business schools about how to take advantage of something, that is an this is an a, a illustration of how not to do that. I mean, now again, that's right because I could what Mark was saying is right because I could completely be living in a bubble, and I and I probably am in this regard, and that I am so connected to tabletop gaming. The geek verse. I mean, I run this channel and all of that kind of stuff. So here, but then, but I do. I'm careful to say what Mark said that. If the, the goal is to get a, a someone who is not connected as a normal person to go and see this movie and go, whoa, this is an incredible movie, and then pick up the starter set from Target and then perhaps get on the D&D &D Beyond thing, it may never – I mean, th there could be so many of those people that it doesn't matter. We will have to see. I do want to say with regard to the movie that I've seen with regard to other movies and things that have ha been happening. We don't, I haven't really been covering movies here, but uh, movies on other YouTube channels I've been watching – you don't want to underestimate the power of a whole bunch of irate YouTuber, a whole bunch of irate <laughs> geeky YouTubers specifically to deal some yeah. damage there. So it's okay. not impossible that some damage could certainly be dealt there uh, as this gets wider circulation and then impact the movie and impact the brand more generally. I think that's that's possible. Uh I think Ryan is completely correct in saying what is the ultimate win? The ultimate win that we have to be driving on is the uh Wizards has to recognize that it has no authority 
to revoke or deauthorize the OGL or whatever. That's the big win. But I would say that if we don't call it a win, something positive that is currently happening is that I, I've never felt more unity and uh, with the community. And, I, and I'm you know, not even highly connected to it, you know, as far as you're talking about all the insiders with publishers and things like that. But as far as the unity of the whole community as a whole and where we are going and pride to be part of the tabletop gaming community and what we're doing, much more friends than competitors, like Ryan was saying, I think that is a, a huge positive. I hadn't felt that in a long, long time, like with connection with anything. But I'm feeling it now with the tabletop community, which is obviously one that I love. And so that's a positive thing that's going on here. 